DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I'm delighted to be joined by Father Robert Spitzer, who is the former president of Gonzaga University. He's the founder and president of the Magis Center, committed to the revitalization of transcendence and virtue through the close connection between science, reason, and faith. He's also the president of the Spitzer Center of Ethical Leadership. He's the author of seven books, including Finding True Happiness, New Proofs for the Existence of God, Healing the Culture, Ten Universal Principles, and Five Pillars of the Spiritual Life. With Father Robert Spitzer, we go inside the pages of The Soul's Upward Yearning, Clues to Our Transcendent Nature from Experience and Reason, published by Ignatius Press. Father Robert Spitzer uses physics, cosmology, psychology, neuroscience, NDE studies, and contemporary philosophy to reveal the truth of our spiritual nature in his book, The Soul's Upward Journey. Since the 20th century, scientific materialism has so undermined our belief in the human capacity for transcendence that many people find it difficult to believe in God and the human soul. The materialist perspective has not only cast its spell on the natural sciences, psychology, philosophy, and literature, it also has enthralled popular culture, which offers very little to encourage the soul's upward yearning. Ironically, the evidence for transcendence is greater today than in any other period in history. In The Soul's Upward Journey, Father Spitzer shows that we are transcendent beings with souls capable of surviving bodily death, that we are self-reflective beings aware of and able to strive toward perfect truth, love, goodness, and beauty, and that we have the dignity of being created in the very image of God. If we underestimate these truths, we undervalue one another, underlive our lives, and underachieve our destiny. We now begin our conversation with Father Robert Spitzer. Father Spitzer, thank you so much once again for joining me. It's great to be back with you, Chris. The Soul's Upward Yearning. I thought the last book was the best. I don't know. This is like a Sophie's Choice. This one is absolutely outstanding. Thank you so much for bringing this forward. Oh, well, I, I, you know, it's kind of like the second phase. So I hope it's not Sophie's Choice, but uh, uh, Sophie's Continuation. <laughs> I like that better. I like that so much better. In Finding True Happiness, I found it addressed so many issues that uh, were underneath the surface, you know, those, those things that we were trying right. to, we were questing for, but we didn't know how to go about it or why we were doing it. But in the soul's upward yearning, this, you take a, a, an incredible paradigm to, I, I, I don't want to say it's an apologetic book. It's, it's so much more than that, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, there, of course, it, it, it has apologetics in it. No question about it, because it's giving reasons for the faith, reasons for the soul, and reasons for the existence of God. So it, it does have that component. But it's really designed to let people know who they truly are, what their dignity truly is, and what their destiny truly is, so that they won't underlive their lives, they won't underestimate their dignity, and they won't underestimate their destiny. So our, our, our clear uh, focus is to try and get them to see not only the mystery of their being, but how God is so intimately present to them in so many different ways, which can be verified by the evidence of reason and experience. And so what I wanted to say is, you know, I do have a third book that's coming out in February called God So Loved the World, which is, you know, looking at the revelation of Jesus. But this book was meant to just say, you can verify the mystery, the transcendence, and the, the eternal uh, destiny of your own being by experience and reason. God's left more than enough clues for us 
to verify this reasonably and responsibly. And, and if you read this book and you do not think completely differently about yourself, um, I, I would be surprised, you know, because uh, honestly, I mean, the mystery uh, of the human being for, for me, just there's so many layers and just writing about it. I, I, you know, it's almost like the fascination, not only of who I am, but who every other human being, every other human mystery is. And then God's presence to every one of us. And, and, and his invitation within us is, is uh, it's kind of like, this is the most fascinating topic in the world. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping people will, will really enjoy it and, and love it. And that's the beauty of the work of the Magus Center, because I think what, what's blooming out of there, the, this tremendous fruit, is the ability to help us to appreciate what it is to think. And I don't mean think so much in our head, but to contemplate and to ponder. I mean, the, the deeper essence of what that gift of our reason is. Oh, uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, in the modern culture, we, we, we so underutilize our reason. You know, Plato was always fascinated by the sophists. And, and, and by the, um, uh, the, the atomists who, who basically kind of gave themselves a frontal lobotomy. <laughs> they basically decided that they could only understand this many things. And therefore, I'm not going to ask any more questions about any of these other things because I, I, I shouldn't have the capacity to understand it. So it's like, you know, you give yourself a, a lobotomy. First, you lobotomize your reason. <clears throat> then you lobotomize your, your natural religious disposition. <clears throat> and then you lobotomize your soul. It's very simple. <laughs> well, Father Spitzer, I mean, it is really <clears throat> that simple. But do you think we have gotten to a point in our culture where even well, using terms like that, when we talk about transcendence, we think, well, that's highfalutin and, and so deep that I can't go there. And yet, th- that's the lie, isn't it? Yeah, it's a total lie. And as a matter of fact, you know, what's going on in in many respects is, you know, um, like, you know, just a hundred years ago, uh, the term transcendentalism wasn't really thought to be a highfalutin term. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> people used it like Ralph Waldo Emerson or, you know, Henry David Thoreau, and, you know, it's thought to be, you know, a pretty normal term. And, and uh, you know, today, all of a sudden, the word transcendental is like, wow, this is too big for people to be using. You know, I mean, uh, that's a highfalutin word. But it, it really isn't a highfalutin word. All it means is I'm not a materialist. You know, mm-hmm. I believe in a soul. Transcendentalism simply means the belief in a soul that can survive bodily death. The belief in a, you know, in a transcendent soul that is capable of doing more than just, uh, you know, what we call perceptual activities, like, you know, that would be able to, to be done by an animal, uh, like you, a chimpanzee or a higher primate. So, uh, essentially, um, human beings that transcendentalists would hold are, are not just an extension uh, of higher primates. Uh, we actually, uh, there's a huge leap between a higher primate and a human being, and the leap occurs in several different areas, in the area of religion, in the area of aesthetics, in the areas, uh, in the area of grammatical syntax, in the area of mathematics. And, and so there's all these areas that are articulated in the book where, you know, essentially human beings are completely different from higher primates. Higher primates don't do any activities like these. And, and of course, they, higher primates, of course, have perceptual intelligence, but human beings have conceptual intelligence. Now, you could say, well, that's all highfalutin words, but basically all we're trying to do is recognize the true dignity of human beings. Now, you, you have to put a word to it. Transcendent means beyond. Why not call it transcendental, Mm -hmm. you know, our transcendental nature? I mean, when we look at matter, we call it material. I mean, that's not a leap. It shouldn't be too much for the the mind to to gulp down. But we haven't been trained in, in, in using those terms. And I think that's one thing, you know, I'm pleading with our high schools 
to start doing these kinds of philosophical uh, exercises again because, you know, um, uh, our kids would benefit so much from it. I mean, you know, why not just give them a one platonic dialogue so that they at least are exposed to, you know, transcendental thought, you know, and, and uh, you know, why not let them know the vocabulary, you know, of this whole arena of linguistic studies, mathematical studies, metaphysical studies, logical studies. I mean, there's just huge areas, you know. I mean, why not just let them know about near-death experiences, for crying out loud? I mean, I mean, here you can prove, you know, almost as conclusively as you're going to be able to prove anything else with peer-reviewed medical studies that 80% of blind people see during clinical death. Now, how in the world can you explain how a person who has no ocular equipment with which to physically see how suddenly, when they have a flat EEG, no electrical activity going on in the cerebral cortex, fixed and dilated pupils, no gag reflex, how this person, without any physical apparatus, suddenly, for the first time, still not having the physical equipment to see in their physical bodies, right, mm-hmm. suddenly says, I, I left my body, I had a kind of soul-like or spiritual body, and I could see through it for the first time and report verifiable data after the fact accurately. 80% of them. How can you say, that? oh, that was done by a hallucination? No way. That was done done by anoxia, a lack of oxygen, not. That, that was done because of the stimulation of the temporal lobe in the brain. Well, if the temporal lobe in the brain you know, doesn't have physical eyes through which to operate, then the temporal lobe in the brain is useless, and stimulation isn't going to lead to a visual apperception if a person has been blind from birth. This is, you know, I, I think the evidence is almost, you know, as irrefutable as you're going to get. And there are a lot of good neurologists that's, that agree with me and neuroscientists who agree with me. Um, you know, not the least of, of which is, is Mario Beauregard uh, down the, at the University of Arizona. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, we have a lot of physicians like Dr. Evan Alexander who wrote that book, Proof of Heaven, and so forth. But the long and the, and the short of it is there's a lot of evidence for human transcendence. We may as well give it a word, and that is we've got a soul, we're transcendent, we're not merely a clump of atoms and molecules. God is in connection with us through that soul in the numinous experience. God is in connection with us even in our awareness and desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. I mean, we're so connected to God through what I would call this transcendent soul which will survive bodily death. We're so connected to God that if we're non-religious, right, Mm -hmm. if we are non-religiously affiliated, this is according to the 2004 uh, study from the American Psychiatric Association done by Candida Dervik and and 10 other uh, psychiatrists, uh, essentially shows that non-religiously affiliated people have significantly higher rates of suicide, significantly higher rates of impulse aggressivity, significantly higher rates of meaninglessness and despondency, significantly higher rates of familial tension, substance abuse, etc. Now, why? Why would that be the case? All other factors being eliminated except for religious affiliation why would non-religiously affiliated people respond so utterly poorly unless we were almost built for God, invited by God from the very beginning, unless we were transcendent by our very nature? That is to say, unless we have a soul which was created by God, a unique soul which is, is ready to receive God, is in fact being invited by God into his fullness, why would we feel like that? By one simple cause, non-religious affiliation. I mean, I, I think the, the, the evidence is just like overwhelming. And, 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 and so I, I just wanted to say to people, don't get scared by terms like transcendence. Learn terms like transcendence, because if you put in the effort to learn these terms, 
If you put in the effort to try and wade through this book, and there's going to be some chapters that are hard because there's neuroscience in it, and there's some chapters that are hard because there's logic in it, but there's also some chapters on near-death experiences and the five transcendental desires, you know, and, and on the numinous experience, the great study done by, by Rudolf Otto of religious experience, the universal religious experience in, in human beings, that are not hard chapters. So there's, you know, but there, there are some hard chapters with some some vocab in there but at the same time if we learn it uh, i mean we're going to see our true selves we're going to see our true dignity we're going to see our you know our unique dignity lovability and goodness in the whole light of our transcendent mystery of our destiny for eternal life and love uh, with the unconditionally loving god we're we're, we're going to see ourselves in a whole new life, never to underestimate ourselves again, underestimate our dignity again, underlive our lives again, and we're going to see other people in the same in the same respect, and never to underestimate them again. And I mean, if you want ethics, if you want people to be truly compassionately responsive and ethically responsive. All you got to do is convince them of the transcendent mystery and the unique goodness and lovability within that transcendent mystery of every single solitary human being. I mean, if you saw that, if we really know each other as we will know one another in heaven, when all the blocks are gone, the blocks within us and the blocks within others are gone, we get to see the true transcendent mystery, we're going to be shocked. I mean, we're, we're going to be uh, completely shocked stunned by the amazing beauty and mystery and goodness, lovability and love of each unique human transcendent other. And that's, all I want to say is, that's a good ground for ethics. So I just thought we needed a little course on here are the 10 best pieces of evidence for human transcendence. And it comes, the vast majority of it comes from contemporary studies. Not from Plato, not from uh, Aristotle. It comes from contemporary studies. And people ought to sit down and look at this and start rethinking who they are, what they're living for, who other people are, and how they deserve to be treated. And if we did that, I think it'd be a different world. But, of course, as you say, it's a slog. People have to be motivated to, well, I've got to turn off my computer game now you know, and read some slog. But <laughs> on the other hand, you'll get a lot more from reading, you know, uh, you know this, this, this book. You'll get a lot more from it than you will from the computer game. The computer game will continue to stimulate my kinesthetic responses, and that's a nice, visceral sort of thing to do. But at the end of the day, there's nothing like having a true vision of yourself, humanity, God, and, of course, the destiny to which you're called. Oh, that's beautiful. We're talking with Father Robert Spitzer about the soul's upward journey, clues to our transcendent nature from experience and reason. And I just want to ha- I have to say this, Father. There's nothing that is a slog through this book. I mean, oh, and thank you. <laughs> I have to tell you, I mean, because, yes, there are, the subject matters, they are d- deeply penetrating. But it, what makes this book so different than other books that come out in dealing with these particular issues is that you orient us in vision-wise through the experience of the interiority first. You right. have us go there first, through the heart to the head. You know how we always talk and you got to go from the head to the heart? But you yep. take the paradigm, let's start in the heart and move towards the head. Am I getting that right? Oh, Chris, you have no idea. I mean, honestly, that's exactly right. That was the reason for ordering the chapters in exactly that way. It was meant to go from the heart to the head because the heart does draw us forward. And, of course, then we need to get the verification. We need to get the logical proofs. We need to get the scientific evidence. And I stick the scientific evidence for, um, you know, for God from contemporary physics. I stick that in an appendix at the end. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very long appendix, but it's, it's nevertheless, you know, it's, it's, it's at the end, you know. And so you have to sort of move through the heart to the head. I, I, I put actually the, the near-death experiences in Chapter 5 mm-hmm. because I, I 
really do want people to move from the heart to the head, to see how God has been calling all along, to see how every human being is, is being called all along. I mean, why is 84% of the world religious? Why is it that, um, um, you know, uh, up to about 70 years ago, about 100% of the world was religious? Because God is present, inviting us. You know, and of course, let's just delve into this numinous experience for just a moment. This sense we have of mystery, this sense of the beyond, this sense of the supernatural, this sense of the fascinating in the supernatural, this sense of, of the mysterious in the supernatural. I mean, we, we have this sense, and not only that, but the holiness and the sacredness uh, of the supernatural. We're naturally inclined toward religion. Why? Why so? Because God has been present to us, calling us, you know, through our souls to himself from the very beginning. And that's the place to start. Because, you know, when I was a little kid, and by the way, little kids do have very valid religious experiences, Mm -hmm. right? When I was a little kid, I mean, you know, I, I would have had no trouble affirming the numinous experience. I absolutely had a sense of, of transcendent mystery. I didn't just have a sense of, of God from my catechism class. I had a sense of, you know, that there was something transcendent and sacred within me. I mean, I would look at these stained glass windows in our church, and I would be transfixed by those things. Now, that would not have happened unless there was something in me that was literally resonating with those windows or resonating with those statues or resonating with that church or resonating with a you know particular uh, song or, or whatever, the crush scene within our, our, our house or whatever it might have been. But of course, of course, there was something resonating, something peaceful, something transcendent, something energizing, something fascinating, something, you know, uh, inviting that was inside of me. And, and all I was doing is responding to it. And of course, then I get into high school and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I'm going to challenge everything now for the next four years. Mm-hmm. Blah, 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 blah. And then I have, you know, some, you know, professor gives me, hey, Spencer, you seen these singularity equations? You know, I said, no, I've never heard of a singularity equation. What does it show? Oh, it shows the need for a creation, you know, of, of the universe and that, uh, you know, that there probably has to be a causative force outside of, you know, space time asymmetry. <laughs> you know, let me see those articles, you know. <laughs> and of course, you you know, I had to work my way back, you know, uh, you know, to the to, to transcendence. But I'll tell you, I, what I found out after I worked my ba- way back to transcendence is all my childhood religious experiences were completely valid, mm-hmm. and of course they're still in me. And all they want to do is be awakened in this adult consciousness now, which can of course respond to God not only lovingly but ethically, and of course try to advance his kingdom in the world. What I love so about, much about it, Father Spitzer, is that experience that, that, that identifying, acknowledging the sense of the sacred. And you help us to enter into that, in that interiority, in our heart, by not using, and I'm not discounting them by any stretch of the imagination, I mean, the, the great, the mystical doctors of the church, whether it's John mm-hmm. of the Cross, Trees of Avila, you name them, Mm-hmm. But you you use contemporaries who have been enlightened in particular fields that can help identify that interior heart experience in a way that head person can I say yeah. I, I mean it's so convincing I oh, just yeah. it's remarkable oh yeah I mean when I first read the studies of Eliada Marcia Eliada you know the great historian philosopher of religion um, you know uh, I mean this guy I mean he. he he was utterly comprehensive, right? Mm-hmm. He writes this, you know, uh, you know, eight volume encyclopedia of religion. You, know? mm-hmm. I mean, you got to be a little obsessive if you're going to do that. <laughs> but I mean, it, this is a, a, a this is a true scholar, and I mean, he goes through and he finally says, you know, what is it that's in every religion? And he goes through and he identifies all of these elements of religion. And what I find fascinating is it's there not because one culture borrowed it from another culture. All these cultures are, they have the same elements independently of one another. In other words, they independently derived 
the same sense of the sacred, the same sense of cult, the same sense of the holy, the same sense of worship, the same sense of, of a sacredness of place and sacredness of time, and the same sense of, you know, a religious propriety, the same sense of a religious ritual. I mean, and you, you look at, I mean, even the rituals themselves, you know, sacrifices, altars, I mean, completely independently of each other, all of these cultures are springing up all over the world doing the same thing. You've got to scratch your head and go, why is it that human beings are universally doing this? And Eliade just gives you the answer, because God basically is present to you, giving you this religious intuition, the sense of the sacred, which causes, of course, all of these desires within you to worship and so forth. And he, by the way, he you know, connects himself uh, very clearly with, with Rudolf Otto as well, you know, mm-hmm. the one who did the, the, the important work called the, the Idea of the Holy on the Numinous Experience. And, and uh, so, but these studies are important, and, and comprehensive studies are really important that include, you know, all world religions. You know, God doesn't leave anybody out, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, basically, you know, you're, God's not going to condemn anybody because of an accident of birth, as, as our good, you know, Vatican II documents say. Mm-hmm. I mean, God is going to, as, as uh, Lumen Gentium says, God will save every human being through the um, uh, saving activity of Jesus Christ, you know, if they seek him um, with a sincere heart and try to follow him according to the dictates of their conscience. That's a quote right out of Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution of the Church. So no, but, so this, you know, you know, we look at it, and of course God's going to give the seven, there's seven characteristics of, of, of religions that are almost universal, which I outline in the book, and, and I just say, you know, yes, of course, God is present, God is present to us in our soul, you know, and, and of course he's calling us according to the dictates uh, of our conscience, and, and, and you know, in, in so doing, you know, um, I mean, he's left a massive amount of evidence for us to, to look at about his presence to us in, in, the, in the interior. This concludes part one of our discussion with Father Spitzer. We'll continue our conversation in our next episode. With Father Robert Spitzer, we've gone inside the pages of The Soul's Upward Yearning, Clues to Our Transcendent Nature from Experience and Reason. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to Ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press, or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this discussion along with many others, go to DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of DiscerningHearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join me next time for Inside the Pages, Insights from Today's Most Compelling Authors.